This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. This week we are discussing Oath of Gold, the third book in the Deed of Paxinarian trilogy. In this book, both Paxinarian and Duke Phelan discover that they really are who they want to be. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin, and welcome to Books That Burn, where today we are discussing Oath of Gold, book three of the Deed of Paxinarian by Elizabeth Moon. Heading into our factions, we have Paxinarian Dorthan's daughter, we have elves, mostly from Leona, humans from Leona, and also from other uh, surrounding kingdoms. And then we have Duke Phelan, Duke Phelan, also known as Falkieri Amroth and Artifalen. Phelan. <laughs> we have we have the Kuiknon and followers of Liert and Arachia and other minor gods. Yeah, so a uh, quick thing to note, and we're going to, we'll put this in our show notes also, but just in case you didn't look at those, uh, we're actually only doing two topics today, but they're going to be lo- they're going to be longer, they're going to be a little bit more in depth, a little bit more involved, and the reason for that has kind of two parts to it. Part one is essentially because in this book, the things that happen to a couple particular characters, as particularly our main character, Paxinarian, are so intense and sustained and graphic and big that um, it really feels like Elizabeth Moon kind of toned down everybody else as anything and didn't really put anything else in Pax's way and, you know, just kind of let everybody else have a better book (laughs) um, in a way. So there wasn't as much to talk about. Like Pax spends, Pax spends the whole book having just like a great time and then it's it's terrible for two chapters. Yeah. So, and then the other part of it too, which kind of goes along with that, is that the two things that we do have that are pretty major are really major, and both of them have kind of a lot of layers to them. So, uh, again, spoiler warnings, or, or I'm sorry, not spoiler warnings. Um, so, again, content warnings, and there are going to be some trigger warnings, are in the show notes. If you haven't taken a look at those... I would stop now, pause our podcast, and do that first before listening. Um, If um, So, that being said, let's get into our first topic. With Duke Phelan, the first time he really lost his identity is when he was literally kidnapped as a child. And the second time was when his wife and children were killed. And so he kind of, again, lost the stuff that was giving him his sense of self. And so we're talking about those two big events. Yeah. And then the third time uh, is our plot twist. um, When he kind of rediscovers his identity as a half and half elven prince. And that discovery, I guess guess that is losing the identity he thought he had. Yeah. It's losing the identity he thought he had. And also it retroactively, loses him a good chunk of the identity that he had kind of built and and kind of like we just said now built and rebuilt for himself Mm -hmm. and he had built that identity for himself of who he was as a person twice in his in his conscious memory that he still had access to and and it's almost like rediscovering his initial sense of identity like kicked the majority of his life kind of out from under him and that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and there are several times we mostly hear about them in a pretty short span. We find out how many there were of these, but there are several times where 
he wanted to swear loyalty to different groups, um, specifically Falk and Gerd. Um, he, he wanted to swear loyalty and be part of these groups, but felt like something was holding him back. And I think that's important when we're talking about identity because it kept him separate and he wasn't able to fold into these other groups to try yeah. and belong as much as he wanted to follow um, the god of the person who raised him, as much as he wanted to follow the god of his wife. He wasn't really ever able to establish that identity in a way that most other people around him were like there's a lot of people where the first thing they say about them is that they're a falcon or a girdsman like that's all throughout these books and he didn't have that very simple thing yeah and actually related to that um i just want to kind of point out for for people who might be listening to this without having read the books or in anticipation of reading the books it's important to note that there is a, a, a in, within the context of the book this is not just a, oh, something kept him tethered. Like, um, in a very real, tangible sense, there was a, a magical disconnect between him and, and, and kind of those things. And it's, it's almost something where, like, he, not re- he might not remember that he had had a different allegiance, essentially, but magically, there was an actual physical barrier. It wasn't just like... It's it's not as it's not arbitrary. No. It's not just a feeling. Like it really it was really something. was a thing. And, <laughs> yeah, and like that an thing is that thing. if he's if he's going to be the king of Leona, he can't. He, it's better that he didn't already swear to a god, and he definitely needed to have and he definitely needed to have not given his allegiance to a king. I'd put those in two different categories. The god is better not. The other king is need to not. Right. Uh, and, and both of those things he had actively set out to do and then didn't and kind of and that's almost like a that's almost like a loss of identity of and of itself like uh, just this he keeps trying so hard to belong <laughs> he does but but even more than that like you know when you when you set out to do something and it's your plan and you're gonna do it and you're gonna make it happen and then you are the reason it doesn't because you just don't do it that's that's a um, an emotional blow. That's a thing that you have to then handle. Because you have to look at yourself and say, like, oh, all of the pieces were in place. I had set myself up. Everyone was rooting for me. We did this. And the only thing that happened Why didn't I do it? is that I turned around and walked away. And he did that in multiple avenues, swearing allegiance to various things, being in charge of certain things, taking even certain positions or not. Um, and, you know, there's there's kind of this they didn't really didn't really explore it very much in the text but that makes sense there was a lot of story to get to in this book and a lot of background to kind of fill in Uh, Mm -hmm. but there's a very real thing where it's very rare that it's something is truly just you sabotaging yourself and it's without any other factors but this is is really one of those there were no functional reasons that he couldn't have done the things that he was looking for other than this this thing that he didn't know about yeah and also like the elves take it as good news that he <laughs> oh yeah felt like he was held back they're like, like oh good it- you still care and he's like care about what <laughs> what are you talking mm-hmm. about i make decisions for me uh oh and that's something else too is where like he kind of we get a narrative where he makes his own decisions always and he built himself up and he made him he he got where he was and in a in a way that does not exist for real in our world. He literally and pulled argue, himself up by his bootstraps. Well, I would argue that he I think that that kind of mythos is built up in the first two books, but that's pulled down a little well, that's bit my here. Point. That's like, my point. Is yeah. that's part of what he he had kind of centered his identity on is that is that he he did this all by himself in a way that even in these books it's pointed out very few people are able to, and it's kind of not a thing. And he was proud of himself for being that thing. And then he finds out, no, actually, you didn't do that. And well, I would argue that that's very much like the real world examples, because <laughs> almost always you find out that, no, uh, they didn't. Right. But, uh, but s- usually setting that aside. <laughs> or, or at least yeah, have the, well, you know, or at least it's really super obvious. It's not, you know. Yeah, well, in this case, I would argue that some of it was... To those who had known him as a kid, like that 
he was taken in the way he was and by whom and how he was trained. Like he was put in positions to have these, uh, to have as many advantages as someone literally on the run in what was kind of newly a foreign country for him. Like, yes, it's where he was from, but his memories were formed somewhere else. Yeah. And so he he finds himself like a stranger in what ought to have been his country and then someone takes him in. And that's yeah. that's gonna be a weird feeling. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like he knows he's from here and there's even a bit where he's he he talks about having been like so excited the first time that he met someone who name whose name is Kiri. And then finds out that's that's like him being named John. Yeah, like yeah, he had no context for it anything. Doesn't tell him anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. It's like that's one of those names that means plow in like five languages. Like there are names <laughs> like that where yeah. like not only is it in a bunch of languages, it means the same thing in all those languages. And if that's all you know, it's a useless. It's the equivalent of your first or last name being Smith. Like yes. Pretty much every culture around the world at some point discovered, like, smithery and had some kind of designation that that meant that you worked and with metal and shaped metal and, like, you know, being super excited because you, you have no memory and you find out your last name is Smith and that's got to mean something. And then you look it up and you're like, oh, well, no. that's useless. Yeah, never <laughs> and, mind. And I, actually... Yeah, because this... <laughs> His first name's common. His last name is common. That's th common enough, at right. least. That's actually something I think is important to note, too, is that he spent time trying to figure out who he was. He didn't just mm -hmm. say, oh, well, I don't know. I'm just going to build a life for myself. He built a life for himself and didn't like he, he also tried to discover who he had been and then gave up. Mm -hmm. He gave up. He oh, moved on. about. Thinking about how early in the books this is seated too, where like oh, yeah. Pax picks green and gold to wear and they're suspicious <laughs> because those are the color of Leona and she's like, they're just the colors of my duke. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Reading this book, I, I, to be honest, I don't remember the difference between reading it the first time and the second time because I was a very small child. I read these books mm -hmm. a lot before the age of eight, but, um, it is. Don't give them to your eight-year-old. Oh, Robin! Don't, no, I Nikki, know. Nikki. Uh, I know, I know. But um, it it is really interesting when you when you know what happens in this third book to go back, and I think Elizabeth Moon. I mean, she does this in general uh, with the those of her series that I've read. She does a very very good job at foreshadowing without it feeling like foreshadowing. Like there's a lot of authors who they kind of lay in lay it on thick and so you as a reader or they or they put it in in a way where it's kind of almost like a nudge to the reader like hey that one's important <laughs> and and well, Elizabeth she actually Moon, does some of that because she has Pax felt like she ought to pay attention to this conversation but that's like but that's she very does have several different. of those she does have several of those but those are like those are not those are not us noticing as a reader separate from the character noticing that's oh, what I'm yeah. talking about like there's a lot in a lot of, especially YA books, there's a lot of like, hey, you as a reader, check this thing out. The characters don't know. It's our little secret. We'll tell you in book three. That doesn't happen yeah, in this series do at all. <laughs> um, like, Pax gets hints when we get hints. But then when you go back and read them, like, there's a lot of stuff. There's so many more. There's just so there's much There's so stuff. many hints to this. There's so many hints to this reveal all throughout the first and second books. I would argue at that and point, even they're the not first even just half hints. Of this one. I think they're just world building. I think they're just backstory that we're just getting naturally. And then it feels... that Because then this reveal doesn't feel shoehorned in. Because you're like, oh, no, all of... It we, feels we inevitable. Knew this already. And like, like, yeah. Yeah. Feels inevitable and really cool. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh this is happening. And even such a simple thing with his name being Artifelin. Yeah, right? Like that's and it's got like an F, and then he's going by Phelan with a PH. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just even something simple like that. Alright, moving on to Paxanarian. So, uh, just, again, just in case... Some of you are, didn't look at our show notes. Um, 
<clears throat> or got this far to uh, kind of see what we were talking about. We just want to put in a um, more of a trigger warning, more extreme than a content warning for um, discussion of rape, physical torture, emotional torture, explicit graphic detail of um, physical tortures and rape inflicted on on our protagonist. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll have more than that in our show notes, but just... Those are the basics. Those are the, the big ideas. <laughs> yeah. So... This comes very suddenly as the most graphic thing in the entire trilogy. There's a lot of mood whiplash. She goes from like the highest point in the series to this absolute low. Um, it echoes the kind of jump that happened in book one with the assault and ban, but it's a much bigger swing. Mm -hmm. And this really was an entire book where like everything's going right. And then it comes crashing down. Um, and she agrees to be tortured for five days and nights in exchange for the Duke and the other captives to go free. And, and not just go free, but be guaranteed safety for the same time period that she was undergoing this torture. Right. So they could not be touched for five days, but then after that they'd be um, free game. And uh, there was some, I was going to say, there's some liberties taken with the <laughs> they could torture her but not kill her because someone, um, we're not going to talk about much, made a bargain to get to kill her at the end of this time. Yeah. And then only didn't get to because someone else um, killed them while Pax was still out. Um, so even the strict legalese of you'll be well it's, you'll it's, be you won't in be a lot killed. of pain it's you won't be killed for these five days and the other person was right. basically like all right five days in one minute let's go <laughs> yep. i get the honor yep. and yeah yeah um, and this this is like a, a it's a self-sacrifice but it's kind of more it, it, it naturally comes out of her like soldier body bodyguard mentality where like not treating her body as her own because her purpose is to save somebody else. Well, and it's, it's more than just not, I don't, I think it's more than just not treating her body as her own. It's oh, no, she, not, her body is her more own than that, but that's a and component. she decides that she is placing that body in between someone else and harm's way. And oh yeah, like her whole journey as a paladin is about choosing yeah. when to sacrifice herself and when to be on the line and not. Um, so no, it, it's not wanton sacrifice. No, it's, it's very deliberate. It's very, I am a physical shield between this person and the harm that's coming at them. And it, it really is in a metaphorical sense, kind of, and I'm sure this is the, the point <laughs> in a metaphorical mm -hmm. sense, it's kind of the culmination of her, her journey to that, that, that status of, um, of being not just a soldier, not just a person who stands it as a guard between others and harm, but explicitly through becoming a paladin and through, and then again, this is kind of the ultimate without dying con like concept of this, just like she is this, she is now a paladin dedicated in every sense of the word to, to doing this all the time. And then she makes essentially the quote unquote ultimate sacrifice without actually dying in the, in this form of this torture. And it's just a, it's a very, very extreme version of what she has deliberately done in her, almost her entire story arc. Yeah. There's and I, I don't want to like, there's, I don't want to have the podcast make people sick. You signed up for these content warnings, but we're not going to like <laughs> list all the stuff that happens no, to her. No, we're not going that... to like describe. There's there's a couple no. things that I do want. Like I do want to mention that she gets branded on her face, um, and she, she when when she so she she does get healed, and even after she got healed, it took someone else telling her what happened to the brand for her to find out 
that she wasn't going to spend the rest of her life with the brand of an evil god on her face. And oh, she yeah. thought that's what was happening. It got transformed into this, like, gold circle or something. They never say totally yeah, what it is. You I'm, can Google what it is. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of art from descriptions. Yeah, but it, it basically turns to the circle. I, I don't have a clear idea of whether it was a symbol of one it of is. the gods she does follow. It, it's the like, symbol which one of do the, you know? I think it's the symbol of the... Is it the High Lord or someone it's else? It's either the High Lord or it's the gods as a collective. It's okay. one of the two. All of them I would, together. Yeah, I would have to. I would have to actually go back and like maybe one of the later check. books will say it, but I don't think this one does say it. But the main point yeah. being, she she gets branded. They show her what the brand is going to look like. Like they show the iron before they put it on her face. And then she does find out that instead she has this like golden holy symbol on her face, and, which. And for for context, I do want to kind of point out, as as I have a couple of times in these episodes, but just in case you know somebody like you skipped a section, like there's a lot in these books where, unlike our real world, um, the gods in the books are extremely present and physical, uh, good and evil and all in between. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody to go around with a brand of an evil God on their face, um, regardless of your own affiliation, that immediately Mm -hmm. makes you first off a target for anyone who does not follow those gods and doesn't know why it's there. Right. Um, It's the kind of thing that someone trying to follow that God might get voluntarily. Um, well, that's not how I read it. I, I would see it as a as a not on the face. No, not on the face. But, but putting it on the face looks to me like it's placing a target on her for followers of that god. Oh, that's, that's how I point. read it. Is that it was? It's a very obvious symbol that would place a target on her for people who don't follow the god. Because if you don't know why it's on her face, all you're going to see is this evil symbol. But if you do follow the god, you're going to know that putting it on her face it means that she didn't put it there, and, and you I, should go after her. And it's it's well, literally might, placing a target on her back. People might know she didn't put it on her face because remember, there's um, this is not the first face branding in this series. Oh yeah, um, well that's what I'm saying. There, cause there was that's my whole right, point. I was going to say there there was the there was the one in book one with the the coward Tenise brand. Turn. Yep. Um, and I. I think that as we're talking about how like the sudden jump from like a very much of a high to very much of a low echoes that earlier section, Mm -hmm. it is totally intentional Mm -hmm. um, for this to mirror and for at the end of this ordeal for her to be branded because it is towards the end of the ordeal, not like the very end, but close to it. Yeah, Narratively, it's towards the end. (laughs) Yeah, narratively, it's towards the end. Um, speaking of the narrative, they, for some, like, this alternates between kind of like, and then they tortured her a lot, and listing very specific things and talking about burning flesh, like, it's got like a lot of wild swings, but like, this is the, the, when we say the most graphic thing in this series, we're we're not saying it's just a little bit more graphic than anything else. We're saying no, this is, that I this is super graphic I, in general. The only reason this isn't torture porn is because there isn't enough description to get into that. Well, like, I mean, and, and the intent behind it is not to glorify it. The intent behind it, yeah, and, and, and like reading it as a story, like that's the other thing with with the torture porn category where. Like the in- the intent, a lot of times, is to make the reader enjoy reading it, and this is very much written in a way that makes you, it it, it makes you recoil because it's so awful, and that's you know, it's it's not done in a way that's an art. <laughs> it's it's very yeah. much just brutal and and awful. Um, yeah, but there's there's a lot um, of graphic there's a lot of graphic description, um, and. This is going to be an interesting one to review, actually, when we get to our wrap up, or an interesting one to yeah. rate. But there's just like, um, with the mood. Well, whip- oh, I remember with the mood whiplash. Uh huh. Um, with the mood whiplash. So I think that the kind of what you were talking about with like the parallels between the book one and 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 this book. I think there's, I think there's a lot of. There's a lot of intentional parallel, even with just 
even with just just the or or uh, contrary ju- juxtaposition also, um, you know, we had kind of talked about like the use, like how in in this book she essentially signed up for this, so to speak. Um, where in the first book, it was very much a thing that just happened to her, that was done to her, without her knowing it was going to happen or knowing even what was happening as it happened, really. Um, um, whereas, like, but in, in both sections, rape or the threat of rape was a part of it. Um, in both segments, uh, like Robin said, a forehead brand, both segments had kind of some descriptions of especially things like whips and and other other injuries and and pain um oh and the the shaving too oh yeah shaving too and they they actually explicitly referenced in yeah the chintzy term yeah they they mentioned that they're like you're you know you you know sheep right you're familiar with this um like they were very like it it was explicitly a, a callback so to speak to to this this knowledge that we as an audience had from book one and and I think that there's it there's a there's an interesting and I think very well done kind of setup where you have in the first book you have kind of you're given kind of a cultural background to a lot of things, a lot of pieces of of what happened in that scene, where you're not given a cultural background in this one, but this is also the more extreme one where you're just kind of reading through the scene because you already as a reader you already know the significance of things like that facial brand you've been handed that information already in a less extreme less immersive context Mm -hmm. um and things like tanisi turin like knowing that means shorn all over like that you you know that already because you've already been told and so you as a reader don't have to kind of stop and think like what what are they talking about what do they mean like you it's just part of the world building. It's just part of you knowing what's going Mm -hmm. on. And it makes sense for it to have been explained to her initially because, you know, she hasn't been in the army before, probably hasn't seen a branding like this. Like they wouldn't have, like the people in the army wouldn't assume that she'd been exposed to this in her village. Yeah. But then like the people of the air are not going to just be like, (laughs) so this is a custom and you know how face branding is like, uh, distressful, distressing. <laughs> yeah, like your your tor- your personal torturers don't your personal torturers don't explicitly explain nah. your own cultural background to you. Like that's not a thing. <laughs> um, but the country girl who's never come off the farm and then witnesses like this thing in a new environment, like yeah, absolutely, you'd get context for that. So the way that I saw this scene and the use of the word consent was I saw it as a very important um, important language because the way it was used and, and when it was used was when Pax was pushing back on people who were essentially trying to tell her that she shouldn't have she shouldn't have volunteered. She shouldn't have done what she did. She shouldn't have swapped herself in for the Duke. She should not have, have taken such a risk or put herself in that position or, um, you know, been the, the, the naive, um, the naive sacrifice, just walking in thinking it'll all be fine. And she was pushing back. The way I read it was that she was pushing back pretty hard because she, knew what she was doing. Like, she might have been forced into making a decision, but she made the decision that she made knowing full well what it was going to entail. And she might not have been able to, like, list out the tortures that she would have been put through ahead of time. She might not have been able to write them down on paper, but she's not... She wasn't going in in any way ignorant of how this was going to go or what it was going to be. And she intentionally made that choice with her putting literally her own body on the line to be hurt and tortured and, and raped. And, and it, it, it was something that she, she signed, um, the way, the way I read it was that she, she was the, 
the party kind of standing in for the gods that her side of the conflict followed. And so in a way, this was a an almost a magical contract that held back the evil gods that were forcing this on her, that were putting her in a position where she she had to even make the choice. Um, but she was deliberately standing standing up in the way of of harm coming to the duke and his family and his his people that he cared about um and so the fact that she consented to be that shield to be that sacrifice um it it was important because nobody else could could look at her and say well you know you're just like you didn't know what you were doing and you just you shouldn't have been there and you should have you know, you should have known better, essentially. And she essentially said, no, like, I knew what I was doing. You don't get to take that away from me. Where I had an issue with the language was more that throughout the torture, they reminded her that she consented to it. And she had it for herself as kind of a mental shield. And I understand it working as a mental shield because she kind of had the perspective of this is just a thing that's happening to my body. And she didn't totally like disassociate from her body. Like she, she definitely did not, but there is kind of um, like a separation and maybe a little bit of a, it definitely like separation. I was going to say aloofness, but that's not quite the right word, but there is a, there is a separation kind of an aboveness of I, I can get through this. This is happening to my shell a little bit sort of a feeling. And I definitely had like a very like visceral reaction of like coerced consent is not consent. And I did not like that Liert's people were saying, remember, you consented to this. You signed up for this. And especially when one of like the big things that happen is that she's a virgin who gets raped like uh, when that's kind of at like the end of the five days um having the word consent used and used against her definitely uh bothered me not in a way like it shouldn't have been in the book because like it makes sense in the book and also this was written in like the late 80s early 90s and so the word consent might not have had all of the things that it does now that for me are very bundled up in it um but it definitely it, it definitely felt very squicky for while she was being tortured to have people reminded reminding her that she consented to the torture, not in the sense that I wanted any agency removed from her, but that I was uh, upset that the evil people were saying, hey, look, we're not the ones responsible for all this evil you brought it on yourself by saying yes. And that's them dodging their agency by putting it on her because she consented. But still, it was it was a thing that was bothersome to read, even if it's the right thing for the book. Um, so that, that was kind of my initial take. I definitely focused more on consent as a word during the torture and not in the aftermath. And Nicole from what you said, you seemed like it was more the aftermath. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's um, my side of that. Uh, so something I just thought of, um, I think the, the throwing it in her face that she did sign up for this because, because they're not, they're not wrong, but also like, I think the pushing it at her like that was a, was just more of the mental torture aspect of it. Um, and, and to be clear, because we kind of talked about this ahead of time too, like, we're both in agreement that this is not a condemnation on Elizabeth Moon. This is very much a very super good representation of, like, worshippers of an evil god. And Liart is literally the god of torture. That's his thing. <laughs> 
in these books. Like that is his realm. His realm. He he excels in causing pain. He is he is the master of torments. Is his official like like title. Um, and so it makes a hundred percent sense in in context of the book that that in this scene there would be every avenue possible, including including um, intentional essentially guilt for what she's going through. Mm-hmm. But it is and also pointing super- out you didn't have to be here, you didn't have to do this. Right, 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 right. Like I think that that almost victim blaming is intentional um, because it is the point. And the focus of that particular deity and, and what he excels at. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, yeah. not, we're not saying Elizabeth Moon did something that wasn't good. It's literally we just wanna a... say... It's a super good representation of an evil god. <laughs> it's very but well done. we do want to say this has, like, emotional torture and victim blaming during torture. That's a thing in this book. Take care of yourselves. Um... They also did the, like this weird bad trick by either lying about whether or not they had other people already captured or capturing other people after technically not having anybody else and then just going and grabbing people um, because part of the torture that happens is that she's told, hey, look at us torturing this person in front of you if you like do this particular thing or let us go after your duke or whatever it was then we will stop torturing this other person and they try to they try to get her to take that on as something that's her fault and she's like you might be lying like i could give in and then you'd still torture this person anyway like i'm not actually in control you don't get to put that on me yeah and i actually personally so as as rough um, as rough a read as it is, I actually personally feel like that particular representation of someone saying, you have to take responsibility for this thing that I'm doing and having a, a person, uh, literally who did actually sign up for some of the things that are happening and, and agree to be in the position to be, to be hurt and and specifically agreed to not fight back and not get out of it and not leave and not defend herself having having this this attempt at shame and humiliation and she looks at them and basically says like no no you don't you don't get to decide that that's my fault and i think that that's a very very good good thing to have in there like as 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 not good as it is that they that they were hurting somebody else. Um, I think it was a really good juxtaposition where it kind of got to show like what she was and wasn't in control of in herself. I just think it was really good characterization, essentially. I think it was a really good like narrative and a really good moment where she kind of like metaphorically and, and verbally, you know, kind of throws off their power and essentially says like, no, you can do these things to me that you've agreed to, but if you do any that I've agreed to, but if you do anything to somebody else that has nothing to do with me, that's your like you're doing that. So take take ownership of yourself essentially and they're like, "No, it's all your fault and you have to feel bad." And she's like, "No, I don't." Moving on to our gr- Wrap up and ratings, our gratuity rating for Duke Phelan. I think it is backstory to either mild or moderate. Um, I would, s- I think moderate probably because it, it, there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of graphic detail around some deaths associated with the main topic. Oh, and like actual events. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The actual, yeah. That makes sense. The actual the actual identity loss is backstory and mild. Mm-hmm. But like um, the actual things that they talk about in the book are a little bit more moderate. I think you're right. Y- yep. Um, Pax. <laughs> Severe. Uh, it's severe. Severe and, and on screen. It's severe. 
it's on screen and the only thing that stops it from being torture porn is that the perspective steps back to be her being aware of what's going on in some spots without there being all of the detail, but it alternates wildly with extremely graphic sections. Well, and it's um, really just like, it's it's all, it's also only stopped being torture porn because of the 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 context and the framing of what is going mm-hmm. on. Like, it's, verbal it's, framing of particular scenes and also just, like, framing of what is happening. Like, it's it's framed in a negative light. It's not framed in, like, a mm-hmm. fascinating light. It, it's framed in more of the, like, brutal physical details of what's going on. Right. Um, torture porn probably would have more of, like, her emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. Um and that's there, but not in a voyeuristic way. Right. Or or even like you're saying just now, like more voyeuristic descriptive words. Mm-hmm. Like words to be consumed by the, the reader, which this scene does not have. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very stark. Uh, for the Duke, the trauma is integral to the plot. Yup. Um, just straight up. It, it is the plot. <laughs> It's the backbone it's of the, the trilogy. Secret plot. <laughs> it is the plot of the of the book. Um, for Pax, Pax, I think this is interchangeable. Oh yes, that is. Oh yeah, that is what I was going to say. Um, you could have done something else, and yeah. also the events are isolated to. It might be a single chapter, it might be as many as two, Mm -hmm. but it's a very, very small chunk of time. Mm -hmm. Um, It, in terms of, like, trilogy story structure, Mm -hmm. it has some resonance, as we talk about uh, in our detail. But yeah, you could excise that section and leave the story intact well, you, could, you, you, could you can't ex- totally you could excise, excise it. it. You would you need could something. Excise it and have, yeah. You could excise it and have a different ending, leaving 95% of the story intact. You mm-hmm. could swap it out for something else and leave 100% of the uh, of the rest of the story intact. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, yeah. But, like, for her personal narrative, there had to be something. And and also we talked about it a little bit of this in the section, but this is there are some very good parallels to other things that happen in the series in a way where it's just very well done and it's done in a way that doesn't feel like it was just shoved into exist. It feels like it's a continuation of her growth as a character. And yeah, it's it's important. It's just not it's just not the plot. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very important. It does a lot of heavy lifting and important work, but that lifting could have been done by something else pretty mm-hmm. easily. It would just would have meant something a little bit different, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, for the trauma being treated with care, for the Duke, so much care. Uh, like, uh, there's. Like, there, a lot of the language, like, dances around some of the ideas of, and we, we didn't even, it was danced around with so much care that the things I wish I could mention now, we didn't get to talk about in our section, (laughs) because they were so far away from what happened. Um, yeah, just a lot of care, and with um with the events slowly unfolding throughout the book so delicately and even more delicately for the trilogy um you agree oh yeah definitely um uh, this is this is going to be a tricky one <laughs> so talking about about uh what all that Pax went through in that that extended scene i think that it alternates between enough care and deliberate callousness it is it is it's artfully placed but it is not gentle that's a really good 
It's there that's, that's to a, that's hit a, specific yeah. notes that feel bad I, for a I, very specific amount of time. I think... So, I think because those notes are there, we have to put this at not enough. Okay. Um, Because I think if... There becomes a point where if this is your topic, there is not enough care. Yeah, like, there's no way to have it be enough care and still have it be what you need the scene to be or be the story that you're telling. And I mm-hmm. think, especially given all of the necessarily graphic things that this has, I think that it is, by definition, not enough. But also, I think it's going to be one of the... I think it is one of those where, if it was enough... It wouldn't, it would then no longer be necessary because it's not the scene anymore and it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And yeah. So, yeah. I don't, th- I, th- I think Robin's right. I don't think it was, I think it was deliberate callousness when necessary, which means that it wasn't, it's not that it just wasn't handled with care. Like it absolutely was, but I think it was like the bare minimum. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or I'm sorry, it was the, it was the maximum allowed. Which leaves a lot of very painful things. Yep. So, not enough, uh, but it's okay. Yeah, it's... We heartily recommend the book with a bunch of trigger warnings. Please take care of yourselves. Ah. Uh, and those can be found in the show view. notes. Point of view for Phelan. Uh, so, we have him describing things but we also have a lot of other people piecing together what's going on the point of view is very distant from him Mm -hmm. um it gets it's not until the very very end that we have his perspective directly on this trauma um i'm i'm writing this down as group slash splintered slash (laughs) philon Because yeah. it, it it really is a it this is a literal thing of like it's some it's things that happened in the past that are getting kind of pieced together by a, by a, a a lot of different viewpoints from a lot of different people, and I mean and also, it's you, it's the character also, you're discovering calling him it. Falan. You're calling him Falan. I call that him is Phelan. not how That's... you pronounce it. But also, you and I have pronounced most names in this series differently from each other. Well, his the elven bit of his name is Artifalon. Artifalon. Uh, That's how I read mm, that. Um, I yeah. So I'm just saying, listeners, when uh, she says uh, Falon and I say Phelan, we mean the same person. I think they'll figure it out. We we yeah. differ on our pronunciation enough <laughs> in this show. Yeah, group splintered. Kind of get well, and I think for the for the aftermath. I think we can call the aftermath, like, once he knows what's going on, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I I think that's mostly him. Yeah. Um, Enough for us to say it was him, because he kind of... We're watching him figure this thing out that happened to him, and then once he has all the pieces, he puts it together. And then, pretty much for the rest of the story... Anytime anybody needs an opinion on it, we do actually hear him voicing his opinion. And I think that that's enough to say that the aftermath is from his point of view. Because even when another character is asking for it, he's the, he's the voice that we get. Um, but, but that had to come after everybody else filled him in, essentially. Point of view of the trauma. This is an interesting one. It's pretty cut and dried, though. Did you just jump to Pax, or are you still talking about Phelan? Oh, Pax. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, point of view of the actual trauma, we pretty much just get Pax. It um, alternates from, like, hovering in the room. Uh, yeah, but that's not a- that's more her like- thoughts. Most of the book is like that. But yeah, most it, of the book. It, I, I, f- but I feel like that's like the that's like the camera aerial view shot. It's not necessarily like a different person's point of view, right? But I just I more meant we don't spend the entire time of this thing in her head. That's true. That's but when we're talking about like, okay, I I just 
when we're talking about like point of view of what's happening, like what we're getting is her point of view. Yeah, like we're, we're not getting, getting we're not getting another person's point of view. No, we're we're definitely getting her point of view. We just don't always have her train of thought. And given right. the nature of the trauma, I did want to distinguish those two. Oh, okay. Um, because it's a very it would be a very different reading experience if we had <laughs> her running commentary like, the entire time and not oh, just yeah. very deliberately placed. That would that would kick her kick it from not enough care into zero care. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's why I wanted to bring that up. Okay. I gotcha. Um, point of view of the aftermath. Um we actually get Mostly her rescuer. Her. Oh yes, her rescuer. Yeah. It's I'm not gonna say who that is, because that is a spoiler. So. That's a spoiler. Um we have well Yeah. I was gonna quibble over rescuer or person there when she woke up, but I forgot how she could woke up wake up. Definitely so, rescuer. Yep. Yeah, rescuer. Um we we don't get any of what happened while she was asleep. I don't think. Um, well, we so have kind of li- a time hop, but that's like narratively. We don't. We don't no, get it, like a. We don't get like a page of and the rescuer I'm meant there, checked if she was I'm awake meant yet. There, yeah, there. Like we, we don't, don't get. We don't get the rescuer's train of thought, but we do get their discussion of what happened. Um, we don't get inside their head, but we do get um a lot of their impressions because they do talk about it afterwards Mm -hmm. and we also get a kind of a a a a scene description of what what happens a little bit Mm -hmm. the assistant junior assistant editor is checking in to make sure that we're doing this all right um i think that's it oh well for those ratings did you have anything else i mean we have to do the rest of our rating (laughs) Well, I, well that's I don't about consider it. the that's writer tip for our to, discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I don't consider the writer tip to be a rating. Uh, what is the aspiring writer tip? Um, I mean, talking off of um, Pax's thing, I would say it's, it's okay to let bad things happen to your characters. It's okay to <laughs> tell us about yeah. them. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I do appreciate that it was not voyeuristic. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's actually a good thing to kind of... Like, it's okay to have bad things happen, and also it's possible to describe them in very graphic detail without it being glorifying. Mm-hmm. And that's... It's hard to do, but it's... You can, you yeah. can do it. It's very, so very notes. possible. There's notes where you get the turn of other people liking it and then hating it all within the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's very well done. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if based on the content warnings, you don't think you could handle this book, I would just suggest skipping those chapters and reading the rest of it. It's that isolated. Yeah, yeah. like, and, and it That's doesn't totally get... totally possible to do. And it's... There's a couple times where it is kind of referenced back to as a, what? I thought you were going through this thing. But there's no detail in those those references at all. Or at least not enough to be traumatic, just very briefly. About the level of our content warnings. Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, and, and I would say that, um, you know, even if you're... I think we kind of might have said this in this series even already, but if this is something that you want to read, but you don't want to try and you don't want to accidentally come across it or not know when it ends or whatever. Like you can even email us or message us and say, Hey, looking at Paxanarian, what are the, the chapters? What are the, you know, in, in your edition, what pages? Where should I skip? Yeah. yeah. Where should I pick it back up once I get to this thing? And yep. we'll, you know, or, or you can even Google it. I'm sure there's a, a guide on the internet somewhere just, as to how to do just... that. Um, this book is old enough for that. For yeah. sure. All right. Favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? You want to go first or second? Because I've got mine. If you have yours, go first. My, I get to think. My favorite non-traumatic thing is the character who started out in the second book and then kind of made his way into the third book, Arvid, the assassin. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I I really like him as a character. I really like the way he is characterized. <laughs> um, I really like a lot of things. Well, he's a thief. I'm sorry. He's not an assassin. He's a thief. Um, well, he only he only kills when necessary. No, but he was um, in the thieves guild. But he doesn't he say he's not a thief too. He does. No, but but Arvid is is. He's just a really cool example of kind of a more stereotypical um, chaotic neutral serving masters who are maybe more on the evil side or or not. We're not actually sure. We're not actually given enough detail to know, but kind of a more classic D&D chaotic neutral um but he he does things for himself, and because his guild has asked them of him, he doesn't do them um, just to arbitrarily cause pain. Um, but he also doesn't do things to arbitrarily cause uh, healing and health. So, but I just I just really like the way he's written, and I think he's he's fun to read. Uh, my favorite non traumatic thing is Pax's horse. Robin, you can't Pax's do the same thing twice. But it's a different horse. Uh. It's a different horse. Okay. Sure. Uh, either that or. <laughs> okay, okay. My non horse. Uh, <laughs> Your non horse thing. Favorite, but this is a magic horse. Um. All right. I had a sneaky no, that's feeling true. that I had that's done one of these previously. Can- you it can, is a different horse. It is okay. It is a so, different horse, but also, is it really a horse? It's a horse. Are you sure? It's a magic horse. Okay, so so separate from the magic horse, my other favorite <laughs> thing is how uh, they're like, yeah, uh, we can't wear swords uh, in Duke Valen's house because then people who we really don't want to have swords can't object. And I'm like, that is a good strategy. I like that. That's a fun thing. It's just a fun it's just a fun detail. It's just funny. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, cool detail. Nice thing. Um I really appreciated it. But but really my favorite thing is the horse. She has a different amazing horse in every single book. It's great. That's true. She does kind of rotate horses she- with her books. She has Star in book one, yeah. Socks in book two, and the unnamed Red Horse in book three. The Chestnut. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will catch you in two weeks. All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. You can follow us on Twitter at Books That Burn, all one word. You can email us with questions, comments, or book recommendations at bookstheburn at yahoo.com. Support us on patreon.com slash books that burn. All patrons get access to our upcoming book list and receive a one-time shout out. You can leave us an iTunes review. This helps people to find the show. And find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks.